Well, good morning. Welcome again to New Home Baptist Church. We appreciate you being here, taking time this morning to give thanks for those that uh, made the ultimate sacrifice on uh, this Memorial Day weekend. Never taking for granted and always remembering that uh, freedom is never free. It definitely comes with a price. And just remember that all those that serve all gave some, but some gave all. And that is the ones that we commemorate this weekend especially. All right, let's raise our hands to our Lord and let's pray together. Father God, we thank you again for another opportunity to come to your house. And we thank you that already our hearts have been stirred by those who laid their lives down for our freedoms. We do not take that for granted. And we pray that you would bless their families, that you would bless the fallen as well as those that are serving today. And Lord, help us to be as patriotic as we know how, knowing that you have blessed our land because we have looked to you for leadership and guidance. But many of our leaders are not looking there any longer, Lord. So we pray for a restirring of their hearts, that they too would be drawn back to you, dear God, that it wouldn't be about money and fame, that it would be about serving the God who has blessed us unrelentlessly all these years. That's our prayer for our country, dear God. So we pray that you would keep our service men and women safe. Keep them out of harm's way. And I pray that they all know today how much we love them and cherish their service. Take them back home to their families safely once their service is complete. As we turn our hearts to our time here this morning during our worship, dear God, we pray that we would be able right now to focus upon you and let down anything that's bothering us or troubling us and right now find ourselves in a spirit of worship before we sing this first song, Lord. And may our time here this morning once again be about you and not about us. We give you praise, honor, and glory because only you are worthy of that. We give our time unto you, Lord. We ask that you would work mightily, that if there's someone here who does not know you as Savior or someone here that that came not knowing it, but today is the day to accept you or rededicate their lives, that you would see that played out this morning during this time. Father God, we give it to you. We love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing for our singing. Well, I just want to ask you this morning, and I hope that you feel patriotic. I hope that your heart's been touched by some things that we've said and seen and sang but you ever feel that subtle nudging or a touch from the Lord to, to share something with somebody? Or maybe do something for somebody? Or maybe get out of your comfort zone and say something that you wouldn't normally say? Or maybe just grab the hand of someone and pray for them in public? Um, you know, this week on Friday mornings, we, we have a Friday morning prayer breakfast. And hey, any of you would... Uh, we would love for you to come and join us. We we go to the wagon wheel on Friday mornings at 630, just a few men, and we read some scripture. We have some prayer time, and we share what's on our hearts. And this week, a guy that I'd never seen before, I remember his last name was a Griffin. He came over when we were fixing to leave, and he was leaving. He said, listen, guys, I just want to commend y'all for being here, for reading the word. And I heard a few things that you were talking about in your prayer time. He says, I just want you to know that made a difference to me this morning. And I said, well, you come on out and join us next week, you know. And he said, well, I'm not in here every Friday, but when I am, I'll make a point to come. Well, maybe something happened similar like that to you this week. Maybe God has impressed upon you to speak to someone, and you did. And something occurred. A life was changed because of it. Or maybe you didn't see a change in that life, but you went ahead and answered and was obedient to God's call. And you said, well, hey, I'll at least try. You see, that's what God intends for us. That's what he wants for us. I hope he doesn't mind sharing, but, or me sharing, but Tim had a such of a moment this week and uh, has tried to reach out to a young man who he was trying to get a job, and he thought he had it lined up. Well, long story short, the guy didn't show up for the job, and um, 
the place of business, called Tim and asked him what was going on. And uh, I hope I've got the story right. And Tim said, I don't know. He, he should have been there. He sounded like an upstanding guy. I thought he would be there. So, so Tim didn't just drop it there. No, he went to doing some research and making some calls and trying to figure out. He found out the young man was in the hospital. He had tried to take his own life. Tim got up with him, talked to him. He shared his story about what all had gone on and how he had lost like three of his loved ones in the last six months and how he just didn't feel that he could go on. Tim witnessed to him, accepted Christ as his Savior. Tim doesn't want any recognition for that. I know that. But Tim called me, just couldn't hold it in any longer. He wanted to share it. That's what we need to do. This has got nothing to do with my message this morning, but let me just say, the worst thing that could happen to us as Christians is for us to get to that point at those pearly gates and the Father say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, come on in, but then ask us, did you lead anyone to Christ during that life I gave you down there on earth? I pray that we can have one, at least one, but I pray that we can have many. I've told you this before, but I've got a good friend of mine that keeps in his pocket a list of three names that he's praying for at that time. Three specific names to come to know Christ. And he keeps them names on there until he finds out one has and then he marks that one off and adds another one. That might be good for us. It might be very important for us to just have a short prayer list and be focused on those prayers each morning. And some things we don't need on our list. We know we're supposed to pray for them. But there's other people out there that maybe we need to be reminded. It's okay to be a Christian and show others that you are. So if you felt that subtle nudging, let me just ask you, do you usually follow God's lead in that? Or do you, like myself, oftentimes find yourself so busy that you don't, that you can't and you won't? You know, sometimes we fight back with all we have to try to change God's mind and what he's doing. He's not listening to you and I. He knows what he's doing. He's got it well spelled out before we were ever created. The past couple of weeks on Sunday nights, and by the way, we will have that tonight at 6 p.m., um, we've been studying these seven realities of experiencing God, and, and also this past Wednesday night at the conclusion of our monthly fellowship meal, and by the way, let me just tell you again, you're missing out on a blessing if you're not coming on Wednesday night. I started to ask Tracy just to come up and give you his big spiel about it, but we got great food, and we got great fellowship. We had a wonderful time of discussion this week, but we have been talking about the life of Moses and God's calling upon his life, and looking back in Exodus and, and reading and um, we, we talked about that last Sunday, and we looked at it again this Wednesday and talking about how Moses was called upon. And, you know, of course, Moses is a well-known leader, and you probably know several important things about him. You know, the promise that God made him to rescue the Israelite people from their oppression and, and slavery there in Egypt. You probably have heard about the plagues that God brought through Moses upon the Egyptian people and Pharaoh and how long it took him to release them. Um, you've heard about the exodus of God's people leaving, finally leaving Egypt and traveling away. And you've heard about the story of Pharaoh and his men traveling with them and following them and trying to intercept them. And God taking them to the Red Sea and parting the waters and them going over. And what happened? The waters came back down on that marvelous army. You've probably heard about the Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses up on Mount Sinai and how his face glowed. Maybe you've heard some of those stories about the ark and the covenant. And you maybe even be familiar with the story of the golden calf that Aaron and the people built to worship while they weren't sure what was going on between God and Moses up on that mountain. Well, maybe there's some things about Moses 
that you may not know. And let's just say that his life was far from easy and it was anything but simple. And his life can really be divided into three 40-year terms. The first 40 years, of course, he spent in Egypt. You remember as a child how he was rescued from the Nile by none other than Pharaoh's daughter. But he was nurtured and raised as God would have it by his own mom. He was taught in the Egyptian schools. A man who was according to the king's rules was supposed to be killed as a young child. But now, as he was growing up, he was treated almost as royalty. But he decided to go back to his roots and see what was going on with the Israelite people. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. And what did he do? He killed him. This is Moses, a leader in God's word. He killed the man and tried to hide his body in the sand. But then when he realized the next morning as he went out to watch, he had been found out. So the next 40 years he spent running in seclusion, in Midian. He fled for his life, became a sheep herder, spent most of his time alone, and where early in his years he was nurtured by his mom and those teachers of the word, now he was nurtured by solitude and he was taught by God, even as an individual by himself. This greatly gifted man in our eyes was a failure and a murderer. He was stuck now in the hot and barren desert, herding sheep, but see, God had a plan all along. He was just the person that God needed him to be and intended for him to be. An 80-year-old shepherd who was now broken and ready to be used of God. Well, that third 40 years were spent with his own people. The Hebrews in the desert, where he was nurtured through trials and tribulations and instructed by the laws that he personally received from God himself. Can you imagine getting the laws of the land from God himself to you and then you portraying them and pouring them out to your people? That's what Moses was asked to do. And I just got to say, Maybe Moses never wanted to be used of God. If you read the story, he was very deliberate in saying, I'm not prepared. I can't do it. Please ask someone else, anyone else. I can't do it. But God wanted to use Moses and he was going to. No matter what. And God gave him all the assurance that he needed in the scriptures. In Exodus 3.12, when he said, I will be with you. So let me just say, earlier this week, when Tim's trying to find out about the guy, and he's called him, and he gets him on the phone, I know what was happening. Tim's, he's hyperventilating it, his heart's beating hard, and he's trying to figure out what to say. God's got it. Because he said in the Word, I'll be with you, right? So this week, when you've had a tough situation and you knew that you needed to talk to somebody about something that was hard and difficult and your heart's racing, God's got you. Calm down. He's got it. When you're facing those issues of struggles of, for finances or health, or job problems, family issues, guess what? God's well out in front. He's got it. But like us, even though Moses spoken personally with God himself, he was still bullheaded and just didn't want to accept God's calling upon his life. Now I'm going to ask you to stand and let's look at these first three scripture verses from Exodus 3, beginning in verse 9. 
Exodus 3, beginning in verse 9. And if you're taking some notes here in your own Bible, just, just underline a few things, and I'll let you sit back down when we get past verse 12. He says, look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me. This is God. And I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go. He didn't say, let's think about going. Let's talk about it. Let's have a meeting about you going. He said, now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? And God answers, here it is, I will be with you. And we talked about this on Wednesday night. And this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain, the Mount of Sinai. They're going to come full circle and worship there together once God's mission is accomplished. You may be seated. As you're seated, you look down, if you've got your Bibles there, and you look down to, to verses 13 and 14, Moses protested and he said, well, who in the world do I even tell them that you are? They're not going to understand who's even sent me. In verse 14, God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent you, has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. And he promised to rescue them from their impression over in verse 17. Let's pick the story up in chapter 4, verse 1. And we see Moses protesting again. Chapter 4, verse 1. But Moses protested again, What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say the Lord never appeared to you? Then the Lord asked him, What is that in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So Moses threw down the staff, and it turned into a stake, and Moses jumped back. Then the Lord told him, reach out and grab its tail. So Moses reached out and grabbed it, and it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. He says, perform this sign, the Lord told him. Then they will believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob really appeared to you. Let's skip down to verse 10. Moses is still pleading. But Moses pleaded with the Lord, O oh Lord, I'm not very good with my words. I never have been, and I'm not now. Even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. Sound familiar? Then the Lord asked Moses, Who makes a person's mouth? What a revelation. Who decides whether people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord? Once again, now go. I will be with you as you speak. I will instruct you in what to say. But again, Moses pleaded, Lord, please send anyone else. You know, I was thinking about this this week, and you probably think it the same way. He recognized Moses as a great leader in God's word. Why in the world, being raised up in a great family of faith, speaking with God on a personal basis, wouldn't he want to jump at the opportunity to serve God and get out front and, and let people know exactly who God was? Well, that's far from what he wanted to do. But God used him anyway. Moses argued with the Lord. He tried his best to escape and excuse the calling upon his life. He had five feeble excuses, and we want to hit them real quickly in the essence of time, as to why he couldn't accept God's calling upon his life. First of all, in verses 
11 and 12 of chapter 3, he says, I'm a nobody, God. I can't do this. But what Moses thought of himself and even what others thought of himself was immaterial as to what God thought he could do with him. You see, sometimes it's not important what we think. Most of the time it's not. And many times, I don't know how to say this without upsetting someone, but many times the more education we have, the less God wants to hear what we think. Because we overthink it. Sometimes we just got to see the reality that God's in control and he's going to accomplish his will no matter what. Whether he uses us or he does not, he's not going to be tripped up. But you see, the past was not very good for Moses. But God knew his heart. He knew his faith, the faith that was ingrained in him as a small child. And he says, I will be with you. And that's really only the assurance that Moses needed. The second thing he said to God, I don't even know your name in verses 13 and following. Now he's not saying there, I don't know God. He's saying, who am I supposed to tell them that has sent me? This guy that I fathomed up in my mind? Who do I say that's sent me to them? God, tell me what you want me to tell them is your name and who you are. Well, we know that the name of Jehovah had been used for centuries, so Moses knew that name, but what he was really asking is how do I tell them who you are and convince them of your mighty power, God? Because they're not listening. So God said, I am who I am. Tell them the great I am has sent you. He who always was, always is, and always will be the faithful, dependent God. I am who I am. Now, even today, people get tripped up on that. I am who I am. What does that mean? I am who I am. Well, he is the first and the last and everything in between. That's hard to describe, but he is the one and only true God. Later on in Jesus's life, Jesus was the I am. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the true vine. It came full circle. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So he says, I'm a nobody. He says, I don't even know your name. And the third thing he says, the elders who know the word and know the scripture and know that there's a God, they're just not going to believe me. They're not going to believe that I had a personal experience with God. Come on. He was completely missing the message, though. It was about the power of God and not the power in Moses. I am is all that we need for every situation. You see, Moses was clothing himself in his own pride and his own unbelief, so he figured nobody else would believe either. Now, don't miss that. He knew God, but he didn't know God close enough to make him known to others. Does that make sense? you got to really know him and want to know him more, and others will see that in you. But over time, he got it. I'd say that his humility here is real and genuine, but if we have real humility, that means that we would rely only upon God's will and not upon our own will. Matthew 28, 20 says, Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age, even unto the end of the world, even through all your struggles and trials and troubles, I'm with you. And tell everyone else the same thing. And then in Hebrews 13, Verse 5, don't love money, be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you, and I will never leave you. Then in verse, chapter 4, verses 10 and 12, Moses said, well, man, I'm just not a good speaker. 
God, you're expecting me to go and do something that I can't. I'm not a good talker. I, my tongue gets all tied up. I, I lose my train of thought. I just can't get it. I'm not going to be able to do this, God. He said, I will give you the words that you need in the time that you need them. And Moses was used mightily. His voice was used mightily later on. Even though he felt he was not a good speaker. The fifth thing and last. Look with me back at verse 13. In verse 13, here it says in chapter 4, he's pleading again, Lord, please send anyone else. Not me. Don't use me. I'm not ready. I won't ever be ready. Here Moses calls him Lord. He said, Lord, please. God, please. He's, he's making it personal. But he says, I love you. I know who you are. But please, send someone else. And he refuses again to follow the orders. As God is telling him, now go. You know, we've all made that same mistake. We simply don't want to get out of our comfort zones. We don't want to take that next step to, to see God use us. Glenda, you did a great job this morning. But what if you said, no, God, I can't do it. I can't do it. I hadn't sang since who knows when. I can't do it. I get all tangled up and I won't know what to say and the mic won't come on and here we'll be. But it's okay. He's got it. But remember, I've said this before. If God isn't Lord of all, then he's not Lord at all. Give him the credit that he's due. Would you believe that one of the most painful judgments upon our lives is when God lets us have our own way and do it our own way instead of his way? It never works out. We find ourselves mumbling, scruffing around, trying to figure out what happened. Knowing that God needed it done this way, it was in his word, but yet we thought our way was better than God's way. He let us go on, but it just didn't work out. Now he'll forgive us. He'll reassure us of his love again. He'll put us back on that right path. God's ways are not our ways. Isaiah 55. His thoughts are not our thoughts. They're much higher than ours. His intents are not our intents. Moses turned out to be a very capable speaker. The lesson here is pretty plain to see. God knows us much better than we know ourselves. So we must trust him and obey him when he asks. You remember that old song, trust and obey? Sometimes we have a difficult time trusting. God, you want me to do what? I haven't talked to this person in five years, and you want me to call them and tell them, I don't know what's wrong with our relationship, but I forgive you, and I want you to know I love you, and God loves you, and I'd like to just ask you, do you know him as your Savior? You want me to do that? Or God, you want me to pray in front of all these people here? You know what? When we share our faults and our weaknesses, we're not telling God anything that he doesn't already know. And when he reassures us that he will use us in spite of those things, then we got to answer the call and keep moving forward. If we don't, we will stumble our toes our entire lives. Warren Wiersbe said it this way, the will of God will never lead you where the power of God cannot enable you. 
Let me say that again. The will of God will never lead you where the power of God cannot enable you. So we walk by faith, not by sight, towards his promises, towards the goal of helping others come to know him as Savior. Getting out of what we recognize as being easy and not difficult, knowing that he intends to use us in the difficult stretches, in the tough times. We had graduates up here last week, last year, years and years. You know, one of the most difficult things for a graduate of high school to see when they leave high school and head off either to the workplace or the college. So many people not recognizing God in their lives. And it gets harder every single year. So as I told you last week, and I hope you hadn't forgot about it, they need our prayers. But let me tell you something else about those graduates. They can make such an impact. One person doing what's right, reading the word, praying, others seeing that happen. Boy, what an impact. And God is sending them exactly where he wants them to be mixed with this group and that group at this college or that workplace he's got a plan and we don't even know it most of the time but we're part of that plan just by going about our daily lives you see we come here to feel good about god to feel good about ourselves to brush up on our scripture to know what god's intents are for our lives but when we go through those doors and we leave this place until we come again, that's when our Christianity really shines out, or it does not. You see, it's easy in here. We're all together. Misery likes company, right? But when we go out there, oh, it's all on me now. Why couldn't I drag about 10 of those congregation folks with me all week and let them help prop me up and me prop them up? It doesn't work that way. God has intentions for our lives. He puts us in the places that he wants to be, wants us to be, and he acts and interacts with us through that daily walk. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for a moment. You heard what I told you about Tim. Tim, y'all come on. About this week. Have you been in a situation this week or last week, last month? That maybe you had the opportunity to share with Christ, to share Christ with someone? Did you take that opportunity? Or did you say, well, I just don't want to rock the boat? What would they think of me if I, if I really share what I'm thinking? God will be with you just like He was with Moses. Maybe you're wondering this morning, do I really have a personal relationship with God? Is he really close to me? Am I drawing close to him? You see, he will let us do it our way if that's what we want. But that's not what he desires. In just a moment, we're going to have an invitation time. And I don't know what God's impressed upon your life and your heart this morning. But I know that the excuses that Moses had were good ones. But God didn't hear them. Because he saw Moses for who he was and how he wanted to use him. You see, the same holds true for me and you. Our excuses are no good to God. He knows what he's done for us. He knows what he expects of us. And he knows how he will help us through it. So what are we waiting on? I'm going to ask you to stand. Let's pray together before our invitation. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Moses. Lord, and I hope the people aren't thinking that, that I'm saying that you had him murder a man and then you just wanted to use that as an example for using him. That's not what we're saying here. You see, Moses took that in his own hands to do that. Yes, it was wrong. 
mightily wrong. But God used him in spite of that. Even today, when Brother George bring those attendants from the prison, I pray that we don't look at them as anything different than ourselves. We look at them as serving their time and being forgiven for what they've done. And we love on them like you love them. Lord, I pray this morning that you have touched our hearts with maybe new revelations of Scripture that we haven't thought about, and that you will use us mightily. And during this invitation time, maybe there's someone here that needs to come lay it all down once again, rededicate their lives to you. And I know you will lift them up and you will use them mightily. Use us all in accordance to your will. Maybe there's someone here who needs to, to join our fellowship here at New Home. Join and become a member. Or maybe even transfer a letter or be baptized. Whatever your intents, Lord, I pray that this morning that it will be played out. Not because of anything I've said, but because how you've worked. Your spirit is here. Let us not quench the spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.